So, yo, welcome, Mr. Nathan Dufour, to Bridge the Gap. This is uh, my name is Holden Stefan Roy, and this is the show where basically we talk to interesting people such as yourself, and we walk through your life and we extract knowledge nuggets from it and we learn. And that's basically the show in a real quick nutshell, but it takes a lot longer in real life. Um, in order for us to land like the super introductory question proper and set it all up, it would be super helpful if you could just kind of introduce yourself real quick. Just let us know like where you were born at, like the very beginning of your life part, not the end of it, the beginning part of your life, and just a little bit about what you do. Um, well, first of all, I appreciate being brought on the show, Holden. I'm happy to be here. Like I said, it's like it's coming at the right time in my day because my day has been strange and this is sort of seems like a grounding experience. But I'll go back farther than that. Yeah, at the beginning, I was born in Washington State. Um, so like not not the Washington that's the capital, but, you know, the other side. And uh, and I came to New York like a little over 10 years ago, maybe or around 10 years ago in the hopes of getting um, a degree, a, a graduate degree and following my girlfriend at the time and trying to rap and two of those things have worked out so i got the degree and i'm rapping awesome. and that relationship ended but now i have a much better relationship with with hilla the killer so um my name is nathan dufour yeah I'm, i guess technically doctor you know because that's my uh, that's my degree so that's amazing um, that's me I and i like to make music i rap about like you know Don't. Uh, philosophical things we're going to get through all of that in excessive detail um, but that first question just kind of helps ground it just for those people that like had no idea who you were uh, We were just bumping your music. I fucking think it's wonderful. Uh, I definitely I don't know It's niche, but if you fuck with that niche, it's the best shit you're ever gonna come across But I fucking came to feel like <laughs> no, it's like pff, It's just for me, but um, we do have a bit of a first question and uh, we like to kind of explore your life Right like a lot of interviews do a lot of things. We decided this is gonna be like a whole different experience um, so the first question, it's a bit of a story when it lands, you can kind of answer it in whatever direction you kind of want to take it. And then we'll just kind of get through the whole experience. Um, and it starts with my girlfriend and she's washing the dishes and she's got her phone and she's playing that black eyed piece song that I got a feeling Ooh. Mm -hmm. she's vibing and she's dancing and she's like doing her thing and all of that. And I'm looking at her and I'm thinking about this song and the fact that this is now like it's chores music, right? Like, which is exercise music. Like, that's what this song is to us now. And like, I can think back, at least for my age group, uh, like 10 years ago, that song was like the club song. That was like the highlight of the night song at two in the morning when everybody was drunk or maybe in your case one, cause the bars closed earlier. Uh, but like kind of everything, <laughs> like we partying to it and doing the whole thing. And that was where that song meant to us. It was like this, this vibe that existed, but then over the course of a decade, whether or not it was the song that evolved or our perception of the song that evolved over time, all of a sudden what once was the club music and all of that good stuff is now the chores and exercise music and the stuff we go back to for those mundane tasks. And I was like, yo, that's a trip. The songs just kind of go on these journeys over time and evolve. And if that's the case, then we as music -y people, our journeys are just kind of like that. They go over time, they evolve and they change and whatnot. But you just got to think about it. All those Cardi B, those kids partying to Cardi B right now. They're going to grow up one day to be washing dishes to Cardi B right now. But yo, what's crazy is people who once, you know, in that age group of the dishes washers now, they're, they're already on that Cardi B. It's just always like that. These songs that play roles in our lives evolve over time. But with that, when we think about our musical journeys, I find, especially in interview line, especially when you're trying to look into people, everybody starts around that adolescent era when we start to form our own identities and attach ourselves to music in this effort to better understand the world, et cetera, et cetera. But really, music kind of like is one of those things that has always been around us, even from like the beginning times. Like in some cases, people have gone as far back as the womb, I, I swear. But like people have such a connection to music long before we have any control over the music inside of our environments with that like i can think of being like three or four or five years old my dad's got these gray boxes like the amp and the radio and the tape deck and everything was connected with these wires going up to all of these speakers and whatnot and he would bust out these led zeppelin tapes and at night it would be this 90s techno music that would be playing live from the clubs and whatnot my mom was super into like musicals and discos and other kind of like love song rock musics and whatnot i wasn't as into that vibe but anyway like 
all I have to say is like over the course of my childhood and as I grew up, there were all these sounds and influences that were completely around me that just influenced me so much and impacted me so much as the artist I am today. So I was hoping you could bring us all the way back to when you were as young as you can remember and walk us a little bit through what it was like, like what it sounded like to be you, the technologies around, how your parents bumped music, all that kind of good stuff before you had any real control over the situation. Wow, this is a fascinating archaeological expedition you've just invited me to go on. Um, I thank like you that. for that question. So, um, yeah, let's let, let the archaeology begin. So, my earliest musical memories are driving around in my mom's Isuzu Trooper. And it was listening to a cassette tape that just happened to be in there. Let me back up just one more step, actually. Not a particularly musical upbringing. Like, my parents like music a lot. You know, my dad had, like, a pretty decent record collection, and my mom was almost totally indifferent to music. Like, she would just as soon be in silence. Very, very dear person. I'm very close with my mom. She loves peace and stillness and silence. Like, you know, she, she's very easily overstimulated. So she would rarely put music on of her own accord. My dad sometimes would. But my earliest musical memory that comes to my mind is... Driving around in my mom's Isuzu Trooper, rather she's driving, and me and my brother be in the car, and there was a cassette tape of, uh, you know, Mannheim Steamroller. He does like sort of like, like pop, pop rock, like '80s rock inflected orchestral arrangements of uh, like classical tunes. It's like it's like imagine like some classical standard, except it's got like a little bit of like electric guitar in it or like a drum set to give it like this like driving kind of thing. And in like the '80s, I guess. This was like just a super novel like way of doing that kind of stuff. There was a there was a, a collection on cassette of Mannheim Steamroller Christmas songs, and we would listen to it all year round because it would have like deck the halls, but it would have like a little bit of electric guitar. It was super epic. It was very theatrical and like uh, grandiose. Just the epic turned up on every front. You know what I mean? Not like in the direction of just like metal like intensity, but just like. Uh, dramatic rock, you know what I mean? Um, they were and we would songs. listen to that on repeat. Yeah, all year, all year. Because <laughs> we just thought it was the most baddest thing. You're like, how could you have Christmas songs but have it have this guitar? You know, it was just, it seemed to us to be like this particularly uh, novel and, and just fascinating world. And very epic. It like made you feel like you were in a film, you know? Because I think that's the other music that I attached to is like cinematic music. And I would always, whenever I was playing games when I was a kid, I was not playing the game. It was a movie that I was in. You know what I mean? It was always a story. And I imagined that, like, here's where the score is coming in. Like, we weren't playing, like, um, you know, uh, the, the game about being on the spaceship. Like, it was, a, it was like a version of Star Trek or Star Wars, you know what I mean, that had the score and all of that because I loved that stuff. You mean, like, video games? No, no, no. Like, like when I was playing, like, make-believe games. Okay, you know? okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Because actually, we weren't allowed to have video games, me and my brother. So we did a lot of, like, make-believe type of stuff. Like, we were... We had shows, like, syndicated shows that didn't exist. You know what I mean? Like, one of them was called Space Battles. It was kind of like Star Trek meets Star Wars. But there's recurring characters and then different episodes. Each time we'd play, it was like an episode. But rather than just, like, make-believe, it's like, I'm a pirate now. Or, like, I'm a spaceman now. It was like, I am a show about that, you know? Yo, that's pretty freaking incredible. Like you basically, in in lieu of having access to the conventional entertainment, you created your own cinematic universe that you told episodically via playing with your brother. That's that's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. And it went beyond that because eventually, like, as we got older, I'm really glad you brought this up. I hadn't thought about this in a long time. We stopped playing the games, but then I would continue the universe in my head. But I was building out the whole, like, media network because then eventually, like, I stopped just thinking about shows that existed that don't exist. But I started thinking about all these all these bands that existed that didn't exist. Like, I had full discographies of these various bands that, like, you know, I knew what songs there were. I didn't know how the songs went because I didn't know how to play anything at the time, you know what I mean? But I knew, like, what the albums were called and, like, what it was all about and, like, the names of the different artists and the different rosters and, like, sometimes I would be... We had a writing mower, you know, and I would be, I would do like interviews with the artists. <laughs> it lasted a long time. No, I, I, is, I haven't is, visited that in a while. It's really <laughs> incredible. 
I mean, just on my end, I used to get grounded a lot when I was a teenager. And when you're stuck in your room a lot by yourself, I used to invent entire universes where I would be the protagonist playing through entire story. And these things lasted years. We're talking like yeah, totally. late teenage years. I would revisit these things sometimes just to like pick up the more advanced versions of the stories. But like, yo, my whole like life was like that. So hearing you describe it is fucking incredible to hear to me. It's a really cool thing. Um, yeah, uh, we did get a question from the chat in the middle of that, if you don't mind a little tangential. Uh, what movies or TV shows were you watching that inspired different scores for you? That's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, I really loved both Star Wars and Star Trek. That was like a huge element of my taste, I think. Because it was also some of the only stuff that we owned. Because we had like, we had the the tapes of like the original Star Trek movies, you know what I mean? I never watched the original Star Trek show. I still really haven't watched it, honestly. But the movies, like particularly, yeah, the one time, the couple times I visited, I'm like, oh, this is not the same as the movies, really. But like, you know, all of them. The the first one, the Wrath of Khan, uh, you know, like all of them, like Wrath of Khan, particularly Undiscovered Country, number six, I think that that was like me and my brother were were so into that. I think we liked it because it was like. I don't know. It was so there's something mature about it, you know what I mean? That felt like we were very elevated by, you know, just the different the attitude implied by Star Trek. It was very enlightened. <laughs> I um I never watched the, a lot of the movies. I watched a few of the TNG ones with my dad, but for me it was the, I just watched the show. Like from TNG straight. My guy, you don't understand how much how much I love the philosophy of Star Trek. Yeah, I've been revisiting uh, TNG in the past like era of my life, and it's it is quite it really holds up. It's 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 it remains philosophically interesting, and it remains also one of the few pieces of entertainment that, on the whole, is an ideal vision of the future rather than an apocalyptic one. Most shows tend to capitalize on our worst fears about what could happen, like oh, this dystopian future. Oh. Star Trek is like here's here's the concerns we would have if we decided to all band together. And you know, get rid of uh, the processes we don't need, like capitalistic, you know, and and extractive procedures and things like that. Focused on uh, helping one another, whatever. Humanity's figured out. World's at peace. Now we have really interesting encounters with totally different types of beings, and we don't mess with them. That's what a beautiful conceit for a show. And it's always defense when there is a problem. It's always exactly. defense. But yo, I, I, on top of that, like the biggest flex in Star Trek that comes up across all of them is we've eliminated poverty. Like you, you hear that yeah, all the time. <laughs> Seriously, Star yeah, Trek like... has been one of the most influential <laughs> uh, shows to how I build my utopia of the future because of a lot of what you just said. So it fucks with that all heavy. I think we need more stuff like that, honestly, because it's like both in regard to the present and the future, uh, entertainment that emphasizes what we don't have yet or, or emphasizes problems that we have is important because we need to call out the problems. But we need an equal measure of things that are like, here's how it could be tomorrow or the next day. You know what I mean? Shows uh, like a, a, a sitcom that's set in New York City or something like that, but 50 years from now and the city has become like a full-on like green city, like eco-city wonderland. Is that the, me the main thing the show's about? No, it's about other stuff. It's like Friends, but in the future where everything is perfect, you know what I mean? And then you deal with other stuff. You know, whatever. It's like, it, uh, just show that setting. Enforce that vision. I like that a lot, actually. Um, I think it's cool, especially your focus on the Shout out, just in case it doesn't come up, like, for a minute. Shout out the fucking composting song. Like, that shit is Yo, a thanks. banger. <laughs> like, they just enforced composting in my building, as in they finally let us have a composting bin. And we learned that most of our neighbors are not good composters. So wow. it, there's like a huge need for that kind of thing. And so I really like the fact that you use music to solution just in case people aren't aware that you do that as we have this conversation. It's super important, I think, cool. because like that's a powerful thing that you're using your platform for. I appreciate that. Yeah. Shout out to, to Hilla the Killer. So, yeah, when I when I play in duo formats with with my friend Hilla and we're Nate and Hilla and yeah, compost is our most recent our most recent song topic and most recent sort of theme. It's a, it's a, a part of one. Um, but yeah, so let's go back to you. So you're like super young and you're in basically conceiving imagination worlds in your head down to like this discography thing where you're effectively doing the, you know, like the, in the wrestling games, how there's the management mode where you just kind of run the roster more than you play the game. It sounds like totally. you're kind of doing that in your head, but yeah. with a bunch of music where it's not so much about the games. It's more like the, the world of it. The logistics yep, very much almost. So. That's super fucking interesting. Um, 
And like, how old were you when you were doing this? Like, how much is older at that point? Yeah, it probably started when I was like, I don't know, like seven or eight or something like that. But then it really continued up probably into, I don't know, how old are you when you're in middle school? Probably up until I was like 15 or something like that, because that's really it only it didn't start to transition until I learned to actually make my own creations, you know, and then there was like an overlap there for a while. But then eventually my free time went from like, the fake world of musical things to like actually trying to make my own music, but it was a slow fade between the two of them. But I would say that the latter kind of replaced it okay. in terms of how I spent my time. All right. So that's a good uh, framework. So like when you're still young though, are you interested in things like drawing or other kinds of stuff? Um, yeah, I love to draw. Yeah. That was my other passion. I, I made uh, comic books, um, that's so and cool. I would sell them with my, uh, with my brother and my friend, Matt. And so we would, we would like, yeah, we would make a whole store, you know what I mean? Like we would just this huge, like ongoing series, not like action, like comics. Like, uh, I was really into Calvin and Hobbes. That was like the bedrock of my like intellectual world. And so I, I had like this series called Jake and Nick. There was no tiger, but it was like a duo, these two kids and the various adventures they'd get into, but it was like comic strip style, you know? Yeah, Yo, you you would just basically bang out comic. How would you sell them at like? Was it like people would buy unique strips or was it mass produced? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, let, no. Let me qualify. When I say sell them, I mean like we would create like a little pop up store and like sell them like to our parents or like go down to the end of the driveway and try and sell them, which like didn't really work, or like sell them to whoever we. You know what I mean? They, we didn't have like a <laughs> an infrastructure for our business. Plus, they were like taped together pieces of. You know what I mean? Like they, they were really like uh, pretty pretty schlocky <laughs> Yo, i'm not i mean you're you're describing it like that what i'm hearing is you being a young hustler pushing your product in a world where a lot of people yeah. make excuses yo one of my big mantras is think like i'm 17 again i find that with a the, i like that because you know you must know about the toolbox paradox thing where like you get crippled by a desire to ha i don't know if i'm describing right but you get crippled by a desire to have a particular tool that will allow you to achieve the next state and then i look at 17 year olds and they don't have tools because they broke and they still do things. And so I'm like, well, hold on a second. How are broke 17 year olds doing things? So that's my whole new thing. So looking at what like the ingenious things people try to pull off when they like eight is an even bigger extension because there's even more imagination and more ways to work around it. So it's pretty just incredible that you're able to take something like a Calvin and Hobbes and flip it into your own thing and then try to hustle that clock in super big experience. So for like all the parents out there and shit, let your kids do that you know what i mean i'm into that i think that's great i mean i think one of the things that that makes me think of though to give nuance to it in a way is like somebody an eight-year-old or a 15-year-old for that matter at this time in a way has access to having like a real store you know what i mean what's 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 to stop them from like actually blowing up with their content nothing and i think a lot of them are is the thing you know what i mean most of my fantasies and my like my world of of uh artists that didn't exist in my head all of that imaginational infrastructure is predicated on the fact that there was a a world that I couldn't access immediately, which was the grown-up world of like media interchange. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't play a show really yet. I mean, I could I could eventually, and I did when I was like 15, but like I couldn't immediately access a whole big audience. Whereas like now, an eight-year-old can't. You know, all they need is a phone, and if a parent lets them do it, they can, and they blow up. <laughs> Yo, one of the biggest fucking youtubers money wise that ryan's fucking kid channel where he's like eight years old and worth more money than like everybody and that's like that is amazing it's like and there's a lot of that i talked to a few of these young ones and they started making music at like like i'm talking like let's say 22 and younger like they all started making music at like 13 because they had access to the mm -hmm. tools because at that point you could just grab your headset and fucking record on your phone and by totally. the time they're like 20 they've just got seven years experience which is just a fucking crazy thing to think about. Whereas a lot of us, because of technological barriers or whatever, whatever, we only start at the later teenage years, maybe early adults. And that just kind of shifts the success uh, accessibility on just the level of experience you're able to clock. So I find it interesting to see how people worked around that when they're young and you using your imagination is a fucking crazy tool. <laughs> I appreciate that observation. I'm really, I like that question. I mean, and so, you were saying you had the kind of, I know that the show is not necessarily like, well, maybe it can go both directions. Like, but I'm curious, like what was your, your, your worlds that you created? Like of what kind were they? 
Okay, so um, I I vividly remember inventing this sport that was based on paintball and like team mm-hmm. sport where like you would just sh- it was kind of like Ender's Game, but I hadn't read Ender's Game, and it was like paintball and I don't know why I was really fascinated with paintball. Mm. Um, and that just turned into this thing where it evolved from like this small regional thing into all of a sudden I was leading a country and we used these paintball wars to battle wow. for shit. But then I got bored being a politician, so I would go undercover on missions myself and devise these whole plot lines. <laughs> then romance came into it because, of course, I was getting laid in this shit. Um, and like, like all of it. Like, and then it was like, la- and then it would turn into like this. It, then I got bored with like that so it became like a sport after I read Ender's Game or some shit like that and then it was like this whole sport that came into it so my country had everybody had to build teams up for some reason and then we had this whole like sporting laser shooting game thing that they would play that was based off of this paintball war thing that was, and I don't know that was that was it took, it took about seven years to bang that out <laughs> that is amazing that, that that is a fascinating world that you just described yeah I mean, it's it was, very similar. Yeah, it's interesting how similar the structure was to Ender's Game, and then you read it at, later. You know that. That's, yeah, I had, that, like, I had no exposure to Ender's Game until like way after I conceived a lot of that shit. But then I was like, "Fuck, man, that's like Ender's Game." When I read it, it was. Like, have you seen the Ender's Game movie? I Is have it, not. It, neither have I, because I almost don't want to. Well, I did whatever. I'll see it if I end up seeing it. But it's a great, it's a great, it's a great book. I yeah, love that book. It's a great. I've been told the rest of the series is banging, but I haven't got around to it. But, uh, Same, actually, yeah, yeah. But my favorite thing about it is like actually not Ender's storyline, but his uh, his siblings and the whole thing that they're doing, like the political and like mm. I felt looking back on that, I always feel like it's very prophetic because they were going by those other names just as kids. It's very much like what we're talking about and creating this whole like staged political sort of coup through their ideological debates that they were having with the stuff that they're writing. But they're writing under these pseudonyms. And it reminded me very much of how things are now, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, using your handle as this sort of mask, but also this battering ram through which you can, like, get into these conversations you really maybe sh- wouldn't have otherwise been in. And these kids do that same thing. Yeah. yeah. Or if you, and, um, I mean, I feel like, especially if you think of that, like, 4chan universe, or, like, the whole stuff. Totally. It just goes, like, a whole bunch of stuff that never would have, like, existed. Um, you know, honestly, I feel like it was almost like a blessing and a curse that I missed being a teenager with that much access like a blessing and a curse i agree i agree i mean i think we're yet to see the full ramifications of the of both the blessing and the curse side in in this generation that's growing up right now i mean that's always true there's always conditions that uh make a generation's upbringing and then subsequent life idiosyncratic and unique so it's it's not like it's a new situation that there is a new situation but the specific ramifications of this seem like they're going to be more severe in both directions um just based on like how radically different everything is everyone's going to understand marketing for the first time in history and that's going to be fucked up could be right (laughs) that's what instagram trains you for how to read through the bullshit of the internet and they're all way better at it than the old people so like yep we're in for an interesting uh fucking switch up yeah shout out keys of life um anyway shout out the comments when they pop up um so basically you're going through the drawings you make comic books and hustle them you create a whole bunch of imagination worlds you bang out scores in your head all this kind of stuff that's running through it let's say as you're going through that phase of life and you start into high school um what are some of your first like when do you start to really get into music more for yourself and what are some of your first favorites also a good question um well I made a radio station switch at a crucial moment, like probably when I was like 13 or so. I started listening to like the alternative station, 1077 The End. And that was like when my musical passion first really got ignited. This has got to be extremely stereotypical in many respects. I mean, I'm from like a small town outside of Seattle, but like I got into Nirvana. That was a huge like sea change in my whole perspective on music and reality and my passions and i gradually gravitated toward what at the time i would have called punk because it was also and it's still called punk but it was like a lot of pop punk as well because there was was in nirvana but then i got it green day was my favorite band for some time weezer after that it was around the time where you're like your identity is forming at high school and stuff like that and so your musical choices are inseparable from sort of 
your cultural niche choices in terms of your self presentation. Mm. And that's what I gravitated to. Also, I just loved punk music because I felt like I could start to make it, you know, for the same reasons that generations of people have loved that because I like picked up the acoustic guitar that like lived, you know, someplace, you know, in our like attic or something and started just banging on it. And I was like, this is cool. I'm like doing it already. <laughs> I've already arrived. And I was fascinated by that ethic. And that's that's that was definitely the beginning of it, yeah. And everything comes from that seed, I think. So it's like that 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 ethos is like very much at the root of my creativity. So you got into Green Day, picked up the guitar, and were just able to bust out some shit that sounded good enough for you. So you started rocking with it. Yeah, good enough to like. I remember writing down little songs on little note cards. I didn't really know chords. I just was sort of like futzing around. But then I, f I had a friend who was taking guitar lessons, and then I was sort of siphoning off his guitar lessons. Like he, he, I would be like, "What'd you learn at your last one?" And then I would just like copy him and like learn it that way, you know. <laughs> Yo, that's an interesting way to work around the system. If we think about how we could apply that into a modern day setting, squad up at like six people, each you cop a master class, and then everybody yeah, yeah. fucking shares the knowledge. That's what I'm trying to do with my degree. Just just wrap it to the people, you know. <laughs> yeah, I really respect it. A lot of my platform is I learned this shit. Let's talk about this shit. <clears throat> totally. Because it, I don't know. I find there's a lot of gatekeeping and knowledge, and it bothers me. And nobody talks about it. Like they talk about the one percent of wealth, but they don't talk about the one percent of intellect. And it's weird because it's the exact same mm. phenomenon. But like, yo, I don't know if you ever talked to a person. And I'm not really. I don't really. I didn't like academia. There was this like pretentiousness to it where I was unable to like fit into that world and I felt like people mm -hmm. learned a lot of jargon specifically to gate the content in order to make sure that people who didn't learn that jargon were unable to understand it. And when you try to approach people with like a simplification effort, like, yo, I could take your complicated and make it simple. There was this attitude of like, nah, I earned this shit that I encountered a mm -hmm. lot and I didn't like that. So I'm like the opposite yeah. with it. No, I think a lot of that is a cover because like, been thinking about this a lot i um because i used to be more participatory in academia in the traditional sense like i would be going to conferences and things like that and presenting papers and i don't know how many academic conferences you've been to but very little there's a lot of people just like reading a paper and then people sitting listening to it and there's not actually a mutual understanding going on because in order to like sit down and like have people have an audience and read your ideas to them and have them be well understood, you have to not just have good ideas. You got to be a good writer and a good presenter. You essentially have to be a good performer. So nice. the only truly capable academics are expressive artists in their own right in terms of the full machinery of what is required of an academic. I love and they're starting to realize this, I think, because I think – academia is starting to break a little bit and show some of its cracks and then ironically like they're you know like i've been working with uh, my friend baba brinkman who started this thing called event rap and he does a lot of like academically inflected hip-hop and he's been getting us gigs me and some other folks gigs like going to academic conferences and then like doing like a wrap-up of like what all the papers are about because oh the conference God. needs it to have some life in it you know what i mean like and academics are going to start to realize this that the really fundamentally older modes of expressive production, which are poetic in origin in any civilization, need to be reintegrated into intellectual discourse, even at the highest levels, in order to survive. And if we eschew that performativity, then we're not only making it so fewer people can understand us in our yeah our 1% intellect niche or whatever, um, yeah, but we're also not going to be able to, to, to maintain the institutions themselves, you know? And when I say we, I don't even really include myself necessarily as an academic, but just the institutions. No, you know? I hear you. So I'm just going to summarize that because when you dropped a shoe, I'm like, I'm going to try to summarize that after. Effectively, um, if motherfuckers be boring, ain't nobody listening. <laughs> you really summarize that quite beautifully. You know? <laughs> um, I think because, yo, I have to I gotta be not necessarily about anyone in particular, but I have gone to corporate versions of this shit. Yeah. So I do the corporate grant and there are a lot of conferences and a lot of the same kind of oppor I wonder if that opportunity exists. I'm going to fucking look into that. That was the best hustle anybody's ever told me that I could actually do. Summarize shit and make it rap. Fuck me. I'm in. Um, but like they're like that. They're boring. So I actually got really far in work, not necessarily because I was great at work, but yo, you could I could break down a PDF editor with flair. I could break down the most boring shit like a rapper. So like people like my demos and my presentations and my webinar skills. Yo, webinars, it's just rapping, but not. Totally. 
And so, but that's if you're like good at it. But like for me, I write it like a show now. I gotta practice it like a set, and like you know, I treat it like like a rapper would treat a show. So like it comes off like that. But yo, a lot of people are just not. They're they're just kind of boring with it. They just talk, and you're like, totally. man, you gotta really focus on what they're saying. And the second that happens, you're not listening because you're trying so hard to like care. And you know, so I hear what you're saying on every real front, man. I've lived through a lot of that. I like that you found a way to yeah to apply that to yeah the corporate sphere and different dimensions because yeah it's it's all the same thing it's all transmission of information and it's a it's a in the economy of such transmission the more successful transmissions will be the ones that have some mental hooks that get into people which is the oldest thing you know what I mean like we we think of like if we're if we're even limiting the discussion to academia like we think of school as this sort of um, one directional neutral transmission of certain facts or data or lore from an authority figure to an audience and in some ways that that reflects much of its history but its earliest history even if we limit it to let's say what we call western civilization so I'm not talking about every single culture right now and I know that even that concept now is fraught but you know among the Greeks like school didn't exist in ancient Greece per se what you had were personalities who gathered followers unto themselves because they were super compelling for their ideas yes but also their self presentation eh, they're like empedocles is that this is the philosopher that's credited with the invention in the western you know stream of content anyway of of the notion of the four elements the guy credited with the invention of the notion of the four elements at least in in western civilization not talking about all 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 cultures the earth air fire and water idea he was, you know, we remember him as a pre-Socratic philosopher, one of the philosophers operating prior to Socrates. But he wasn't just that. He was like a pop star. He wore these like fancy multicolor robes. He referred himself as a god. He had a whole coterie of like adorers and he expressed all of his ideas in verse. He was not just like a rapper type, but a super flamboyant, like crazy pop rapper, like pop star extraordinaire. Love it. He was he was over the top with it, you know what I mean? And what the what gets transmitted, you know, about his legacy is not that typically now in school, but just like, yeah, four elements idea. There you go, boom. Yo, everybody does make this shit boring. So I copped this book on Icelandic poetry from like mm. the year thousands to like twelve hundred. It's basically like whatever. But you realize these Icelandic poet types <clears throat> would have to show up in like the King of Norway or whatever. And man's would be like, bro. You best write 88 bars about how I'm the shit on the spot. And if you do it, you get a sword. And if you don't do it, you die. <laughs> and then they would quote the bars. And not all of them because it was boring. But this is like, and meanwhile, you realize all of this is just bars. The whole book is oral yeah, history, is. which is man spit in poetry. So when you look at a lot of this older shit and you like realize there's a lot of repetition and a lot of things like that, it's because they're basically dropping like hundreds and hundreds of bars of story to document history and that just to me like blew my fucking mind on how nobody broke it down like that to me until i read this icelandic book now that's that's such a good point yeah no that that is that's precisely the point that i'm making and it's and it's a super important point it's actually what one of my next projects is i want to do a song an article about this about like the bardic tradition and it shows up in so many different instantiations you know that like Bard is a Celtic word for like that, you know, that uh, that extraction. Rhapsode is the is the word in Greek. Grio is the same concept fundamentally in the West African, you know, tradition, which is already so intimately connected with hip hop's uh, self reflection, you know, in terms of looking at like what are we doing here. Uh, but it's just it's not it's you can find it instantiated in pretty much any civilization of which we have evidence with important differences, obviously. But the differences are superficial compared to the essential feature of a poetic transmission of information in oral poetic modes you know that's what it is in the same way that you can trace the gesture to comedy serving a very similar function creating that exact parallel totally. throughout fucking history i love that shit i mean because that's why like i don't know I'm, I'm a big believer that looking at things like the etymology of words with yo when i saw you did etymology raps i was like bro i didn't even know i needed this <laughs> in my life that etymology of hip hop video is like a must watch in my opinion. And she's yeah, fire. It's that. really and then when he flipped it to trap out of nowhere, I was like, get the fuck out of here, bro. You really <laughs> did that right. But like, um 
I just think it's important shit. And a lot of people act like you can't predict the future. And like you can't, but you can certainly make much better educated guesses by studying the past and looking for the patterns of cyclical shit and what worked. And yo, like the fact is like, even in the pop stars of like yesteryear, right? They were all influencers, but they were rebranded as thought leaders and political activists, which are both just influencers. But somehow with the word influencer, really? people are acting fucking weird about it. But if you call it influencer or a thought leader, it's cool. Like that kind of shit, it's like wonky to me. Like the idea though is consistent. I would almost say that it's analogous to, I mean, again, I keep taking it back to Greece just because this is like what I have studied the most, but, um, when we say influencer almost in a pejorative sense, when there's like a little bit of a note of judgment in it, it's similar to debates that were going on circa like 5th century BCE Greece between what's a philosopher and what's a sophist. And the sophist was the word for the person who looks almost identical to the philosopher, but they don't actually have substance. All they're doing is uh, making their profit by making it seem like they're wise or showing you how you can seem like you're wise. Mm. And I think that difference does exist because when we use influencers, sometimes we are implying that, that it's like this person doesn't really know or do anything. They're like the middleman of information or the middle person, or they're just the empty form. You know what I mean? Like the, then the typification of that would be like the, uh, the influencer who's like, all they do is show you how you can be an influencer. You know what I mean? Who's like just the, the, the empty formalism of it. And I'm not even passing judgment on that, but mm. I think that like there is something to be discussed there because but you have to look so at somebody to, who has influence so and go like, would you who uses the term the most people who have not achieved success? You don't hear successful people being like that very often. Totally. Unless yeah, they're yeah. haters. That's true. So, right. Right. So I bring it back to some fascinating examples where people act like this, um, influencer vapidness was all wasn't always part of it but like yo tupac was a movie star you know like and you start looking at these different people and you start realizing how much more they did than music how much more like character and lore building went into who they are which is really what influencers do a lot of focusing on good or bad now mm -hmm. we can argue there's a lot of bad and that corporate advertisers throw way too much money at people they shouldn't thus creating a lot of chasing of things that aren't real but at a fundamental level, there's no such thing as a celebrity that's not an influencer. True. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like Quite people true. do stigmatize it because they simply want to believe in this world where talent and meritocracy exists. And that's right. often where the negative tinge comes from only because of who says it. I don't hear the people who are down with the cause saying it, you know, like people who are into subscription models never say it. People who have right. retail stores that are doing well, never say it. They're like, yeah, this is just great marketing. But then right. you get people who are unable to replicate it. Yo, that's influencer shit. I'm a fucking artist. I'm like, bro. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good point. Yeah, which, which I can also, I can understand that to a certain degree psychologically. Like, I, I mean, I'm not letting. I think you're right, and I'm not letting those people off the hook per se. But I'm <laughs> having been one of them almost. I would say, like, up until the past couple of years, <laughs> it's it's hard to let go of your uh, preconceptions about what the mechanics of creation are. You know, because you know, going back to the thing I was talking about, I was imagining a whole artistic world and I sure thought that when I was making my own art, I would be able to follow that same world where you just make sure you're really good at it. You get it in front of the right eyes. Somebody does the work for you of presenting it to the world and puts you on that pedestal. And then, you know yeah. what I mean? And then, yeah, you know, and like that's hard to let go of. And it makes sense that that like especially like our generation yeah. is struggling with that to a certain degree. And I, I am totally guilty of it, which is why I feel like I can identify it because I had to let go of it. I had to get over my, yo, I feel like artists who are really focused on technique lose sight of the fact that it's only really artists that are focused on technique slash super fans. That's what I call that niche of really hardcore fans that also love technique. And they're a tiny percentage of the mass market. And it's a super saturated area because that's where everybody who's really into technique does. They gravitate towards technique and they forget about style. And, mm. and you could have the best substance in the world, but without style, you're indistinguishable. So you have a whole bunch of people who focused on only like part of it and marketing is a huge part of style. And it's just like, I feel like a lot of us just wanted it to be easier because a lot of our idols had teams and then we also wanted to be independent because that got glamorized but nobody said that independent meant you run your own marketing promotion and even explain the difference between the two etc cetera, etc cetera. right no it's such a good point that's such a good point and when you put it that way it drives home 
I think an important learning thing, especially for, yeah, for again, like our generation is like that dream that we had is actually like a less holistic one of being like, oh, I just make the art and I don't have to worry about how to present it. Or that thing about like, oh, I don't care about the marketing. Like marketing is, you know, that's somebody else's problem. Like that's not a very mature worldview, you know, because again, like look back to the ancient precedents. It was about having it all, <laughs> you know, you got to present it all. Just like as a human being in a conversation, you have to both, you know, have some substance to offer your interlocutor and have some kindness to offer and, you know what I mean, uh, present uh, in a way to them that is attractive and, and approachable, you know what I mean? Like map that onto the larger thing and, yeah, you got to have it all in your deck. Big facts. You know? And I get that, but I also think like, <clears throat> I mean, it's a deep conversation about why like the millennial era people are pretty bad at this shit. I think uh, there was a lot of lies told to us systemically and it's very hard to accept the cognitive dissonance of reality. But like, that's, that's just kind of doesn't change reality is I think the thing is, whereas I feel like you look at the younger ones and they're like, fuck that, we're going to take that real and run with it. So they're mm -hmm. just like super into this influencer world of marketing and branding and like just working together and they're like watch 12 youtubers live in a house and that house is a mansion but they can afford it because there's 12 youtubers working together and it's like yo how are all these young people collectiving and i'm a whole like everybody i know is individualistic and they just want to like even to the point where i'm like yo bro if like seven of us just cop the house <laughs> you know like how much cheaper would that be but we, we can't do it privacy this that all this other weird shit. i don't know yeah kind of runs through my brain a lot no, you're bringing up some really important points that that, that is that like that desire for that de the desire for solitude that prevents you from being able to collectivize is based in fear, not not real desire. You know, I, I shouldn't say that of everybody, but I think if I'm because I'm guilty of that, too. You know what I mean? Where I like refuse to incorporate because I have this precious vision of my singular value that's going to be sullied somehow by like having it incorporated with others. And I think that's to be re-examined i just didn't like getting made fun of i'm gonna be real with you i didn't like Same. that a lot so i stopped ha fucking with people and so i started fucking with people and then they weren't making fun of me anymore well they do but it was with love that's a whole different kind of right, thing right, right. and i was like wow the world changed a bit but maybe i changed a lot so it is what it is i feel like i did people keep telling me that so i'm less self-centric i pay attention more to others therefore i can present myself better to people and it's simpler but um i don't know it's a whole process and it's super hard so I guess hard things are not attractive to people. Um, there's a lot of laziness in the world. But let's go back to True. you. And you started making music at 15. And what kind of, and where you you had your guitar and you was busting up your uh, chords and learning off of your, your boy. How did you get into like actually recording? And did you have a band? And tell us a bit more about this era of life. Yeah, eventually I I like got so into it that I was like, this is what I need to focus on. And uh, my other like extracurricular activity was baseball. And when I was 15, I was like, dad, I'm not going to play baseball anymore. It's I'm starting a band. And he was like, then you're getting a job. So did that as well. <laughs> he wasn't super into the idea, but that was the choice I made. And I began, uh, playing with a couple buddies. Um, our band was called finger teeth, Teddy officer, long story behind it, but that was the name. And uh, I played guitar. I played rhythm guitar and sang, mostly just because nobody else had the the fortitude to like, you know, get over the embarrassment to sing. <laughs> but that's what I did. Well, actually, but I wanted to. In my heart, I wanted to. That's what I wanted to do. And so yeah, that was us. It was like yeah, yeah, two guitars and a and a bassist and a drummer. And that core group like was pretty much, especially my my co songwriter um, John Alice. Um, who's now a playwright in LA? Um, he and I like ended up being collaborative partners like th throughout all of high school and into college. Like we we really like that that began a, a creative bond that lasted for like almost a decade, maybe more. That's that's super cool. So you're able to get like you have like the real high school band type shit going on. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. To 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 the fullest extent. And what job did you get at that time? I was a dishwasher. Straight up, so you were basically living that Nirvana dream. It was that, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It like really was that world. <laughs> and you started performing around that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I still remember our first show. It was a f disaster. So it it was it was. I mean, I I look back on it with fondness, but we were on 
this bill to play at lunch because our high school was divided up. There was like the main high school and then there was a freshman campus just where the freshmen went. And uh, the freshman campus was doing this thing where like at lunch, uh, different bands were going to get to play because there was like two or three bands. So over the course of the week, they booked the different bands that uh, existed in the school. And we went and, um, I mean, it was not going well. Like, we were getting actively booed, like like food getting thrown at us. Just like a classic, like, your worst fears are like the, the, the painful scene from like a high school movie. Like, it was that. That's how, that's how badly we were being rejected. And I wasn't going to take it. I was like, what's like the punkest thing I can do right now is to like fight back. And so I picked up this... Uh, like um, chocolate milk thing that they had thrown at us and I like opened it and I was going to throw it back at them but my throw like didn't work out because I just doused myself like in the milk and my friend who was sitting like right in the front and like it was just this totally ineffective you know rally back <laughs> and then that embarrassed everybody even further and my whole even my band was looking at me like dude you know, it was it was bad. It was it was very traumatic, actually. <laughs> Didn't go well. <laughs> Fair enough. <clears throat> did you do a, Did you do more performances after that, or was it like the end? Yeah, we kept no, no, we kept going. I mean, we never we never quit. Like we 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 struggled for a long time to like find a, our pocket, really, like performatively. And actually, that was kind of like true for a long time for me. Like I think I had other friends who were developing much quicker in terms of being really good at performing and really like just like they're starting to sound like a real band and like me and John like in our various different instantiations like that band and other bands I think it took a, took us kind of a while to like nail the pocket of it really that didn't happen until um, I got we 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 simplified like because we both got into uh, folk music and like that was that was where I started to feel like comfortable because it was got rid of all of the this is like a new musical interest that I had. And then removing those other elements and just getting down to the simplicity, just like me and a guitar, is where I sort of found my my voice and my performativity. I think. So basically, you got into a simpler genre, so you were forced to simplify. Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Which is what I wanted anyway. I think in my heart, yeah, I, I love simplicity. Not to give any disrespect to folk, it took me a long time to get into folk, but once I got into folk, I really started fucking with it. It's got like a vibe. It's a vibe. What was your What was your access point? I don't really remember specifically. I just know shit like Tegan and Sarah exist and like a, a mm. stuff like that. I mean, I can't, like, it's hard for me to think of what is folk, what is alt rock, what is indie rock or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. So it's kind of blurred, but that kind of sound, just a few other little things that would appear in, in the indie scene, usually girls. Usually it's all related to trying to get laid that I got into folk. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I feel you. I feel like that's like one sphere of it. Like I, I mean, more like I was into like, like, well, it started with Bob Dylan. That's pretty much what it was. Like mm -hmm. I got in Bob Dylan. I was like, oh, holy shit! Like I don't even have to worry about the whole arrangement, and everything like that. Like I can just have this guitar and like really have it be about the words. That's what I was excited about, is to not worry about anything else and just like this directness. And then from that, I got into like more roots music, like Woody Guthrie and Lead Belly, and like, and then like you know Delta Blues stuff, like Robert Johnson and stuff like that. Like that was kind of that. You know that's what, what took hold. I know what it is. I've seen a lot more live local folk music than I have actually like absorb famous people, mm -hmm. and I just watched the way that people would approach it. Like it almost seemed like, in a sense, a low and uh, an easier approach to getting into live gigs, that, and, it, and it's really accepted in Montreal. Like people in Montreal fuck with that. So like if you go like yo hip hop is like as an example a hard thing to fuck with. So it's not so much that there's a lack of like people that do it. There's thousands of people that do it, but there's not even ten solid venues you could rely on to perform at in an area of like four million people. So like that's a serious because there's like almost like systemic attacks on hip hop, but like a serious promotion for like jazz or acoustic rock or whatever. So like. Mm because of the venues and these opportunities and then you look at this folk vibe and it's like yo this this hipster will come on stage with like a fucking guitar or a piano or something and just bust some jams about like the simplest shit and i'm like what was crazy is how much you related to these fucking songs i would be a hater because i'm a rapper at that time but like <laughs> in hindsight i found myself resonating with the simplicity and the humanity of the vibes yeah, I think there's a huge difference too between like because it sounds like you're describing more. Like I, the, in the same way that like 
I think there's something very kindred about folk and hip hop um, in a deep way, which is that like somebody can. Uh, it's easy to get started in the sense that all you need to rap is the mic and then the beat's just going on, you know what I mean? And, like, you can come and do your thing and, like, as you're first getting started, maybe sometimes you'll kill it, sometimes you'll show that you really don't have you don't have your sea legs yet, you know what I mean? I think it's the same thing with folk and it's easy to, like, fake it at first, you know what I mean? Like, you can you can sort of front, for, and, but, but people will see through you because you're so naked. They're both very naked modes of performing, you know what right. I mean? When it's just you and the beat, you're not even singing, you're just rapping, you're just speaking, and you don't have to be technically good to be amazing. Um, and it's same with folk, you know what I mean? Like, there are technical aspects, obviously, but you're, you're naked. It's like the stand-up comedy of music, you know what I mean? Like, it's just you and that microphone, or you and that guitar, and I think a lot of people, if they're just doing it on the surface, it's like you could take it or leave it in the same way that an MC who's not really connecting, you could take it or leave it. It's like, you know, uh, so I think they're, they're kindred in that way in a certain sense. Yeah, I respect that. <clears throat> I also like the fact that folk is just one of those terms that reflects local music of a culture. So it's so like totally. out there. But I guess I meant Canadian folk, too, because like whatever folk i was exposed to probably would be slightly different than what you were exposed to just by virtue of you being out in washington at that time and me being in totally. quebec which is just a very different vibe <laughs> um, absolutely so yeah basically you were in bands you're performing a lot are you also like recording and producing eps and all this shit i haven't talked to a lot of people who did the band version of this to be honest so it's it's super nifty yeah yeah we we did that we like um um, we, we, we cut a couple albums. We had to like you, find like local people who, who recorded us. Can you describe what it's like to like record a band? Like most of us are comfortable with the rapper producer dynamic, but what's it like to like actually deal with logistically dealing with like the band thing? I do not miss it. I'll tell you that much. Like, cause it's so, so much more complicated. Recording drums is so obnoxious. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, even, I don't even like going into studios really. You know what I mean? Like I, I have no, I have no like, uh, desire to like go have somebody else record me. I love recording myself. It's one of my favorite things about, about, about this, this mode of creating is like, I can do it myself and I can do it anywhere. And it was complicated as fuck. It was really complicated. <laughs> Yeah, mic and the drums and stuff, you know what I mean? And, like, finding studio space and, you know. Of course, at the time, like, we didn't have our own, you know, DAWs on laptops and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm sure it's easier now even for bands. But I, I still hear horror stories of drums. No, Nobody likes drums now. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's not. And it's just not. It's hard to defend why it's even necessary for a lot of artists. Um. Mm, that's a good point for a lot of artists i mean i could defend why it's necessary acoustically because you know the imperfection yeah. makes the art and that right. you can tell you know i think one of the biggest disservices to rock music was uh engineers fixing drums biggest totally. disservices like it just sounds whack like when you hear every like fucking snare pounding perfectly or like fucking bass drum and you're like nah you cop and i know they do this because i watch rock people talk about it and complain about it on the fucking internet so like when you listen to everything now, it's so fucking loud and smashing and it's like, it's so glossy. Whereas yeah, so yeah. what attracts yeah, me to like eighties punk is how the opposite, like you can hear every dynamic fucking drum smash in a way that like totally. is beautiful. So I think there's an art, there is a beauty to shitty drum recording that needs to I be brought agree. back. Totally. But yeah. Um, so you're doing that for a while and um you're recording how, how are you like moving your albums like how do you what do you do after you record it are you using the internet yeah we or? would just no we weren't very internet savvy like i didn't even have like a i mean it was in college by the time i started using the internet for music that's when i had like a myspace and stuff um but in high school we would just push them at shows we would just just sling cds at shows just burn cds and sell them to people we'd do an open mic sell cds play a show, sell CDs, keep CDs like in our backpacks and like try and sling them to people. Um, and you could kind of do okay because we were in a, like a rural sa a rural town uh, and like, you know, there's not a lot of competition. And so it was like, because we were, we were outside of Seattle, like, like, like a 40 minute drive outside of Seattle. And so there wasn't a lot of music going on in the town. And so it's like, you can get people to buy it because it, plus you're a kid. So people want to support you, you know? <laughs> There's like a sense of novelty about it. Mm, so teenagers should really be pushing this mixtape grind. Absolutely. It's probably different like in cities like Montreal and New York. Though. I, don't, I don't know about that. Like if we, if, okay, cause like teenagers have access to like 
selling networks like cadets or things like that or like uh, scouts and shit where they really could hustle all their friends parents and shit yeah. where in a way that they couldn't i mean you might not want to sell a mixtape about bitches and hoes if you're 16 but like <laughs> <clears throat> if you can come up with some shit that works fuck it i don't know like right I just, that's what I like to do is like, I hear these stories and I'm like, yo, a lot of people made money on mixtapes by selling them when they had access to people. And I still think that there's enough people with cars that there's a market. And when I say cars, cause so many people have CD players in their cars because they still have CDs and want to bump them shits. So mm -hmm. like with that, there's a market. So maybe it's not the hottest market, but there's enough people, especially in rural places. Oh my gosh. Everybody drives. Let me, yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I, and and I feel you on that, and I'm like, uh, yeah, I just there's this UK label that just reached out to me a little while ago that wants that's that's gonna do like some physical production for me and make some tapes and CDs, and I'm I'm really excited to have those around again, just in my, as something I can offer people and enjoy myself, you know what I mean? Yo, congratulations! If you want to jump Thanks. ahead, how did you pull that off? Is it? It was, it was, it was, it was like the dream. It was like where they just reached out to me and they were like, we found your music and we want to do this and we'll pay for all the production. And then we split it 50, 50, you know, for physical sales. And I was like, there's no reason in the world for me to say no to that. <laughs> they're cool. Cause they're like, it's there. He's, he's like also kind of like somebody who's been doing, doing music. Like I have kind of since he was a kid, like in terms of being in bands and stuff. And like he, uh, he, I think, wants to, it's almost for nostalgic reasons, wants to, like, create a space for that kind of musical encounter, you know what I mean, of, like, buying buying that obscure CD and, like, you know, getting to know it. That's super cool, man. I'm really happy for you. Like, just that, that could even Appreciate happen. That. Like, hearing you get that is like, bro, that could happen to anybody. Dude, in oh, the yeah, UK totally. Behind you? Yeah, yeah. Happen to anybody. Totally. You do have some Absolutely. really fucking nice stuff. Like, Thanks, really man. decent, like, production value on your videos to, like, make it more you know the lyrics are a huge help to like digestibility and quickness so i respect that shit a lot thanks um that. so you're basically in high school banging out mixtape sales and already making money off of music before you're even like an adult that's pretty incredible well i appreciate that perspective on it yeah that's true man that's what it is it's just the untracked shit that nobody talks about because it was untracked and it was only really thought about recently when people started tracking totally <sighs> So you're doing that. Would you guys do merch? Yeah, we would sometimes do that. We like had stickers and stuff. We had um never really got into doing shirts. But but yeah, we um yeah, we would mostly just do the CDs. CDs and stickers were kind of the thing. Did you get to like tour around or was it more like you performed at the same few spots? Touring for me started <laughs> in in college. Like that's that's when that's when we started doing that, but not really in high school. Because I got through the rest of high school, and then I moved away. Um, I moved to Atlanta for no reason whatsoever. Well, you were, I moved to Atlanta because I'd gotten into hip-hop, and I was, like, really into, like, Outkast. <laughs> and for some reason, I was like, if I move to Atlanta, my life will figure itself out. And so as soon as I was 18, I, like, went there. <laughs> and I was just sort of trying to, like, scope things out. Um, and... Uh, you know, nothing really panned out. I was there for like a year. I was only 18, you know what I mean? I didn't, it was hard to make friends and stuff like that. Like I was like very like intimidated by the big city and uh, that was totally foreign to me. And um, I was though going to this place called the Apache, which I hope still exists. I mean, I haven't been to Atlanta since actually, but it was an amazing hip hop club that did, they had battles and they had like, they did shows, they had open mics. And I wasn't really rapping yet then. I was kind of into hip hop almost like, intellectually you know what i mean like i was becoming a really avid appreciator and i was starting to develop some of the associations that i have with it like on the tip that we were talking about with like its connection to other forms of oral poetry historically and so i was like i kind of wanted to like write about it and incorporate it into my writing and i was just very fascinated what kind of um, what kind of writing were you doing i was working on a couple things I, I wrote these two plays that i never did anything with that were kind of like it was like Hamilton before Hamilton in a sense. It was like it was like they were written kind of in verse and sort of like in a in a like hip hop inflected way, uh, but they were not about something historical. But I'm just saying in form, you know what I mean? They were like these verse plays, or they had these these like rap moments in them, and uh, they weren't they were about other stuff. But 
they were just my own stuff of my own imagination. But that was like a big thing that I was working on. I didn't really have a sense at that time of like how to bridge the gap with my writing, you know what I mean? Or like find a context for it. Mm. But I was doing that and still writing songs. And then eventually ended up going back to Washington and uh, went to, then I went to New York for a second um, to start college, but I ran out of money like right away because I was going to the new school and the new school was mad expensive. And then I was back to Washington again. And then that, that's finally when I started like really getting into hip hop in earnest um, with that same friend, with my friend John. And we started like rapping together and uh and so, and doing that so when did, so what year was this that you started rapping <sighs> bad with calendar years so let's see i graduated high school in 2005 i was doing it kind of casually then but not very often rest of 2005 and part of 2006 i was in atlanta 2006 so like 2007 maybe 2008 is probably when it really started being like a central part of my life awesome so I'm glad you asked that never thought about that well, it's interesting to me, right? Because I do this now. I'm doing this a fair bit, so like I'm curious about certain things. So when you start rapping in that era, studio gear is a little more accessible. So are you able to do it at home, or are you like going out to other places? Yeah, no, no. I had I. W it was very insular to me because I was also still in bands and like doing like sort of like folky like rock and roll type of stuff. And the hip hop for me was like it was like my weird closet thing that I did secretly. You know what I mean? Like, cause I didn't have anybody, I didn't have like a community of fellow rappers or anything like that. I had a few friends that were really into hip hop as listeners. And from them, I was like learning what I liked and what my tastes were. But it was like, we would, we, I, we were doing our band thing and stuff, but then I would go home at night, you know, or in all my free time more and more, I would just like smoke tons of weed and record on my eight track, um, just whatever, like whatever beats I could find or whatever so whacked how, out how beats I could make. Beats? I would look for loops on the internet. Like I would like literally search because I didn't like, I didn't have any idea like even how it was done. You know what I mean? Like something as simple as just like find like an existing beat on YouTube and like use that. Like that didn't occur to me. And so I would I would like find like uh, sites that shared like free loops and then just like layer a couple loops together and like. They were, they were the most rudimentary, just like ridiculous beats. I also didn't really know how to match them up very well. So I'd be recording into the 8-track, just like pressing play and then trying to match it up. And as a result, had these jangly fucking like, you know, very like Frankenstein-y uh, beats going on because I just had no idea what I was doing. Again, I had no, I had nobody to I in, bet, in, like introduce me, you know. Like doing that right now on purpose would have such a huge like fucking niche cult following that it would pay. Right, right. Like fucking like people would be like, what the fuck is this sound? And it would just become like a wave. That sounds like a wave. Waiting I love to that. Happen. <clears throat> totally. Totally. I should, I should get back to my old methods. <laughs> But yeah, it really felt like, uh, in retrospect, it's like, you know, you it's you one benefits from having like a family that brings you into something, and like hip hop, especially in certain ways, you know what I mean? Like people who show you the ropes, people to jam with. That's something I lacked for like a lot of years, and so I was really going down my own wormhole. I think in some ways it was cool because it made my my way of doing it really idiosyncratic. But like, um, I didn't have like a a crew, you know what I mean? I relate to that a lot. Um different reasons because less of an excuse when you live in a fucking metropolis with a lot of rappers but i was weird and i didn't like people so i didn't try very hard to socialize and i thought i could just be the best like no one ever was and get out there and like impress the world so i kind of relate to that rabbit hole thing it took me a long time to start talking to people actually straight up this interview quest fucked up my music game in the best possible ways because like really you start talking to music producers you start talking to beat makers you start talking to video people you start talking to rappers singers i mean you do folk music you know like all these different perspectives come through you start talking to battle rappers and shit and all of a sudden you start finding commonalities about like certain things and other ways of doing things but all the music producers 100 percent agree about all the same shit so how is it all the beat makers and producers agree and none of the, the rappers go out in fucking weird paths but all the music making people seem to understand music in the same way and that was super astounding to me so my new rule is listen to producers <laughs> just shut the fuck up and listen to producers and then somebody put it like really good uh a rapper is an actor and a producer is a director and mm. all the best actors have directors and all the best rappers have producers 
And I don't mean sure. like a beat maker. I mean a motherfucker that says, do better. <laughs> I mean like your take sucked. Totally. I mean like, yo, you're super high right now and your decision making process is not correct. Like the number of times I've done really awful musical choices because I was too weeded to like, or like, or like you get lazy and you're like, yeah, yeah, that's it. I'm done this. That's as far as I'm going on this song. When really, right. like, who the fuck cares? Do it again next week. You'll fucking feel better. Yeah, right? So totally. those kinds of yeah. choices where, like, you kind of don't know where the quality thresholds are. And then there's the other angle where you become internet rapper friends with a bunch of internet rappers. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but it's another epiphany I had um, where the only people you interact with are effectively you people on the grind whose music that is consumed only by people who choose to listen to us. We all do the same thing. We DM everybody. We all go to the same forum groups. So it basically means we all expose our music to like exactly the same audience of ourselves and we all like it. And it kind of takes almost an entire squad of the underground in a direction towards catering more towards technique than, uh, and a perception of substance. Cause what does substance means? What does lyrical mean? Fuck man. What does that even mean? It's a big topic. But no, that's you bring up an interesting thing because yeah. But it, where are like, the fans at? I mean, the consumers, the product, the people who would inevitably buy your shit and show up to your show are not included in this like almost circle jerk of quality threshold that has existed because of an internet thing. And when you find people that party, they talk to regular people and make better music that has less substance, which is fucking fascinating. Well, it's, it's 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 a really important point that you make. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways to hack it, and uh, maybe it comes down to, like, the question is an individual one in some sense. It's like, is your community slash audience self-consistent with what you want? Because w if what you want in this world is to, like, be exchanging music with like-minded people and be in a sort of society of artsy rappers, then great. You know what I mean? That is some people's goal, and that's self-sufficient for some people because it reflects a world that they want to live in, and I'm 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 with that. But I think that, yeah, for myself, I've been having similar realizations to what you're talking about and realizing that, like, I do want I do want uh, to figure out substance to me consists in how well are you creating a unique and meaningful contact point between yourself and people who are truly other people who, like, have had a different experience in the world, but they understand what you're saying and it resonates with them because you simplified and pared down some sort of truth, whether it's musically or ideologically. And you're connecting with them on that point. And that's a less insular exercise and has less to do with technique, as you say, or rather less to do with technique in the same way and something more yeah. to do with like a Let, real. Let's, okay. Like, but I mean, when I say technique, I'll be more specific to like the mechanical performance of an art. And I feel, or like, <clears throat> like, like how many, like, like polysyllabic rhymes you have or something like that, yeah, or like, you know, like, speed or something. A lot of times it comes to speed. I don't know why. Well, I mean, I kind of know why. But a lot of times it goes to speed because there's like this idea that, okay, everyone else is doing all this other shit. If I can go faster, I'll crush it. But then if everybody can rap fast and then you can rap rap God, then like what's the point anymore? Like how fast right, is this right, shit right. going to go? You start going down yeah, yeah. that like path in your head. And then I, I realized a lot of people rely on speed because they don't have a way to deliver bars that are slow really good. Right. And then I realized Cardi B's got delivery that I can't touch. <clears throat> um, yeah, I feel you on that. Like the uh, the no slow is a great it's a great thing. It's, it's a good thing. To, it's a good thing to learn because yeah, you you have to ask yourself, where am I like maybe hiding in like supposedly difficult things and not like giving myself truly to to the song or you know to the listener, or like the reality is people like sing alongs. So is repetition really bad? Because I want to write more words. Right. You know, it's just shit like that. It's also that. taste, too. Because, like, sometimes, you know, like, I, I, as a listener, I'm not, I'm not, I don't adore repetition necessarily. You know, I tend to be attracted to music, even older music that doesn't repeat itself as much and that involves more adventure and, re and requires close listening, you know. And in, in that sense, like, uh, you know, you can be making qualitative decisions. So you do have to make, you stick to your guns, you know. I totally agree with that. But that also has to come with the like self-awareness of where you're going to stand in the totem pole. 
Like I true because if you're thinking that that is because dem- sometimes it comes with a humility and an understanding. Like I know that when I do complicated shit, it's not gonna sell. So why am I even gonna bother? I'm doing it for the art reasons of doing it, right? And if I want to make music that sells, I have to make music that will sell, and that's a completely different experience. Right. And like people can argue a lot of things, but one of those is a marketing point about how to connect with an audience and move a product. And one of those is about creating art for who you want to create art for. And I kind of want to do both. So I managed to segregate my career into art for myself and art for people. And I find myself really happy with that, like median. Yeah, that's a, that's, I, like, I like that way of framing it. I mean, I think for me, when I'm really nailing it, it collapses into two because it's like if you, or collapses into one rather, like it, that whatever whatever like bar you're working on or let's say a verse let's say a 16 that you're working on that is like first phase i'll even limit it to myself let's say it's like some song where i'm trying to teach a certain concept so it's mad mad complex let's say lots of like you know multi-syllabic words just you know because of the complexity of the idea but then i do another draft maybe and it's like it pairs it down to being like okay this is like more in the pocket musically but it's still like super technical and kind of like idiosyncratic for for like hip-hop idiom you know but then maybe that third draft like it's simple and accessible to everybody, but it still embeds all of that complexity. It's still there on like a subconscious level. And I think that's what I want to do is like exactly. push it a little bit farther to the point that it's like it's it's not um, inaccessible, you know. That's it. But there's like a focus that there is a compromise. But even if you want to go in like a, a different direction, look at Aesop Rock's career. His early work is like 10 times as complicated as his newer work. Totally. Because honestly, totally. at a certain point, he's like, I kind of want to eat off this, I believe. Or I, I want people to connect with it or whatever it is. I think he just got better. Is Honestly, what that like, mm. I think he's an, he's an example of a... Uh, um, this is kind of rare in like indie rap too, of like an artist who has truly improved with every album. And his most recent stuff, oh where he gosh, shows you that he can world. do like super, super dense stuff if he wants to, but he can also do like simple almost childlike simple storytelling or like the one about like uh the, it's a trap one where he, you know what i mean like everybody that i've shown that you know that one where he's like he's like oh maybe it's a trap like he's sort of talking to himself you know what i mean like and it's on that new album and yeah. like uh everybody that i've shown that to is like laughed out loud at it because like it's such good storytelling he's learned to do the thing that looks easy but is not easy and like that's 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 like a role model for me in that way because he has gotten better because he's gone from the realms of crazy abstraction and niche like um, abstraction and 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 like colorfulness into like becoming a more universal creator. Yeah. People very seldom do that. Very I, seldom. I think his recent work is a big inspiration as well because I find it replayable and I think replayability is an interesting concept. Like I realized something. I started thinking about like music ten years back. What do I actually listen to from 10 years back? Right. I fuck with the Black Eyed Peas. I fuck with LMFA. I know it sounds like whatever. But I realized I actually like a lot of that shit from 10 years ago a lot more than, say, Hobson. Like, I can't bump mm-hmm. a Hobson song no more. I'm like, whatever. There's nothing that I can right, right, with right. in that sense. But I don't know. I got a feeling's a banger. I could listen to that every day, and it puts me in a better yeah, mood. Yeah, yeah. And I started just noticing that like seals kiss from a rose is just ethereally beautiful (laughs) and like there's just these songs and none of them are like really over the top on a technical front it's all these feelings i was getting and i just realized feelings matter like so much if you want to connect with people and to create timelessness to me that's also super like fucking fascinating how do you create timelessness with your music totally and there is like great idea but it's like a mastery of it like you said with aesop rock like it is a matter of taking the most complex things and simplifying them into the most tangible and simple thing so if i can take your very complicated sentence and put it into five words to me that's a bar totally totally but you, you as you did it earlier you do it with elegance man that ocd song oh, that shit was like bro yeah, I'm i appreciate impressed. that I, I could not write that or allow me to be clear i do not have the patience to write that see that song actually came out like a lot more simply which is i think it relates to some of the stuff that we're talking about because like uh oh by the way just a heads up i gotta go in like 15 because i gotta i gotta clear out at 7 30 how long do you usually do your show it goes for hours sometimes oh wow wow i, sh- I wish i had blocked out more time is that all right though yeah, like it's totally are we fine. just okay, totally right fine, man. It's like, i'm really enjoying this conversation you um, can always set up a uh, part two in the future yeah totally totally i'd like that actually um but for instance, with that song, because it's like, 
That's the song that's very personal to me. Should I be like establishing context for the people that are listening? Or, or, uh, like... Yeah, go for it. Plus, it uh, be yeah. linked in his stuff below, which in the future. Oh, people... nice. Okay, cool. Right on. Um, so, like, I do. I have done over the past couple of years, like, a lot of sort of educational songs. In a way, it's like here's this philosophical concept or topic. Let me let me spit it for you. And like, it's almost like. It's very dense. It typically has been. And recently I've been realizing that the missing ingredient and the place where I'm going to find my simplicity is making it about something that's real. It's still about philosophy. It's still philosophical. There's still sciencey parts in that song where I'm explaining like brain chemistry and stuff. But it's grounded in a real personal and real painful experience for me. And that's why it feels like a real song, not like a lecture that's using music to get itself across. And there's a very subtle distinction between those things. And like, I think I'm like finally landing on it. It's like the muse still has to be in charge and you're bringing in like knowledge and stuff. In my case, like I'm bringing in didactic information. I'm bringing in philosophy I'm bringing in academic themes because that's who I am. But it still has to be grounded in what the muse wants and what the muse wants is to express your heart, you know? And so it was like, that's sort of my theme recently is like, how do I marry my braininess with my heart? How do I start listening to my heart more? And I realized that that's sort of like a, you know, sort of mystical and maybe vague way to put it. But no, I think that's right. how I feel. I think it's a, it's a really interesting way to put it. Um, because a lot of people fear that simplification is going to cost them their artistic integrity is my belief so that the, or that adapting your art in any kind of way from what you've been doing or pivoting or whatever is going to like change something mm -hmm. in a negative way when often it's just going to make you a better artist and i mean i think that's a, to me art has to do with communication if you're not like this is my views and i know it's not complete because there are artists who create art for the sake of art and they die and nobody knows they make art that shit is baffling to me so it's hard for me to even put it into the like it's hard for me I, I just want to acknowledge that but for me art's about communication you have ideas you bring them to life in an artistic way you achieve a goal and it's for somebody even if it's just for yourself and, totally. and at the end of the day that's that's all it is and everything else is just fluff you could have like the most bullshit song and everybody loves it for some reason and I mean like quality it could just be like fucking like Bjork has a song she recorded like on a mobile fucking tape recorder at a live event while she was performing went into the bathroom went outside of the venue and that made the album and I never saw music wow. the same again I was like oh you that can do that amazing. that's Bjork right like she's pff, she's the queen of the right. artsy weird shit yeah yeah totally so yeah what what else are you yeah. up to though? If we only have like ten minutes left, then what else are you up to so that like you get um, an idea of your near future and shit to watch for? Yeah, so I am. Um, I mean, I got this grant from End of the Week. So shout out End of the Week. This shout is how this is week. how we've we've met each other. And um, uh, the Versus Foundation, honoring the life of Vice Versus, who is just one of the what the, the patriarchs of of End of the Week here, and and uh, has was a mentor to all of us throughout his life. Uh, this, this, this foundation that got established in his honor um, gave me a grant to pursue a project that I was originally calling the Hip Hop History of Philosophy. I want to do a whole history of philosophy through songs. Um, and it's kind of changing form. It was originally going to be like an album. I think now it's more like a YouTube playlist that just like almost an encyclopedia of like if 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 musicality and like rhapsodic rap is your way of getting information like here's how you could get a primer on the history of western philosophy or you know there you go so i'm definitely going to keep on adding to that um that and i have an album coming out um at the end of the summer it's not exact date yet but hoping to get it done by my birthday on august 11th or have it ready to release by august 11th and that'll be some like more more personal um just lyrical stuff lyrics for lyrics sake songs for songs sake type of, type of stuff do you plan on performing a lot? I do. I actually am performing a lot now already. Um, so I also play with uh, with Hilla the Killa as Nate and Hilla, and we were busking today at McCarran Park in Williamsburg. We're doing a compost tour, um, and so <laughs> we, we, we're going to tour all the different compost drop-off sites. I don't know how composting is in Montreal. You said some of your neighbors have, like, bins that they can okay. – does the city pick them up? Okay, so, like, there's – brown bins that you're supposed to yeah. put the composting in and then my belief is it goes to a composting cycle where they basically chuck everything if it's not filtered correctly by us 
So very mm. little of the composting will make it to the composting on some human error shit on some, they don't like to filter things. I don't know the logistics of why's or whatnots. So I just know that's how it right. is with recycling. So why would it be different with composting, you know? And that my neighbors weren't the best at composting in our building because um, my girlfriend is super into compost, like super, like nice. she wrote out this thing, a handy, helpful tip guide for like the door so I could know that eggshells are compostable and that pizza boxes, I think, are not and then shit like that, right? Like, because the city made the resource, but like, yeah, no, I don't even, there's a lot more garbage than compost up in my building right now, but I know that when we switched it up, like, it was like, oh, fuck, if you're actually composting correctly, a good, like, 50% of your garbage becomes, like, compost, just like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, pizza boxes are, right, she's giving me shit, I did it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't remember. Yeah, well, I'm glad that you have a brown bin program. It, New York City just brought theirs back, and so, like, one of the big reasons that we were getting on our activism um, grind with this was that in the middle of the pandemic, New York City canceled its composting program. And so all the composting that was happening was by virtue of local community composting chapters that that like sort of, you know, raised uh, their own degree of involvement to keep it going. And like you had to like save stuff in your freezer and then you'd come drop it off at a different composting drop off location someplace in the city. And there's various ones at different parks or different corners and stuff like that that operate on certain days. And so what we're going to do is do a tour of the different drop-off sites. Like, you're like, yo, you live in Queens? Like, we're going to be at this one on this day. We're going to be at this one on this day. And just do a, like, tour of the city busking at these different sites um, to sort of just give them some love and celebrate the hard work of the people that make it still possible, even though New York City canceled its own program. That's so, serious. That's, I'm pretty sure Montreal, like, I know the apartment buildings, it was just made, like, mandatory for them to have them and i know the, the the houses have had it for a bit but yeah so like education music about recycling to me or or even composting sorry is seems super relevant and like a hot topic and i like the fact that you were describing how if the fruits are underneath the fucking plastics they can't compost because of lack of oxygenation i didn't know about totally. that shit so i learned about that yeah, in yeah. your song and um so you guys busk around but do you do like um like like, let's say, would you come to Montreal and do some shit? Yo, I would absolutely do that. Yeah, I mean, like, as stuff is starting to reopen, like, I'm I'm extremely excited to be playing shows. I I play a lot at uh, a club in Brooklyn called House of Yes, and so they're going to be reopening soon. And, like, they are important to me because it's been a place to do not just, like, regular shows, but also shows where I can kind of, like... Um, break it down like where i'm like not just rapping but also like explaining a concept and then going like in and out of the song and like creating these sort of interactive performative environments which is something i'm really interested in doing because it's it suits um my my way of performing and uh yeah yeah, yeah i want to rock as many shows as i can I'm doing a lot of online shows but i'm pretty ready to start doing it in front of people again yeah serious though i like the fact that you're productive with this and pushing it through we definitely have to have a part two there's a lot that you're doing that a lot of people could learn from in terms of just how to be successful with it how to grow from i would it. love to do a part two i i've really enjoyed this conversation you're you, you have a really I, I just love the idea of starting with the very beginning <laughs> i mean it, it's laziness um how am i supposed to find out anything about you is the truth of it like people act like you can just google people but bro like i'd have to go stalk your facebook and twitter for like 20 years i don't have the fucking research team for that <laughs> shit so my like solution to be able to make this sustainable and repeatable multiple times a week with minimal research was make episode one the research and then it exists for everyone i talk to for all future people at least somebody does because nobody does it like no okay, no that's amazing people do it's it, amazing but, like, and I think, like, if we ever do get significant, this, like, as in my platform, it counts as a wiki source. I have to totally. become significant first, but that would count for everybody. Retroactively. That's, that is a beautiful way to think about it. I love that. I find you have to attach it to huge goals if you really want to achieve it. Totally. But yeah, with five minutes left, um, I guess it's a good time to wrap up um all of your links and stuff are like i put on a bot and whatever in the chat and then it's gonna be all down below so they'll be able to like look into it because you made the wonderful link tree so it made everybody's fucking life simple it's just like the one link and then you can browse through all of it and you should like yo he attached that he didn't say to his ocd song 
this entire blog article thing that was kind of like all the thoughts that couldn't get into the song so that you could have like a better sense of context and a more digestible like blog content flow so like there's a lot to the universe of nathan dufour that is fucking interesting <laughs> no other way to put it yeah i appreciate that man appreciate that and uh y'all should support the mans um thank y'all who watched up through the live it's always great to have you with us it makes it more fun um special thanks to the patrons uh ismail gnam secrets about jonathan brian cj black Kirk, and linda williams uh, scribble to top support what we do patreon.com slash behind that suit if you're into that um and shout out end of the week um they definitely shout enhanced out end of the week. my life in ways that i wasn't you know i'm in montreal right so the fact that somehow like big zoo is somehow I'm, part of my life is kind of unfathomable to me considering i didn't even know who they were two years ago it is it's true yeah they're, they're the most supportive family like they're simultaneously the most like classical hip-hop like just like the most through and through hip-hop but mm. also completely embracing of whatever fringe you know version of hip-hop you do you know what i mean like I, I just i felt so embraced by them so uplifted by them so yeah so with that, it was great to have y'all. We're going to start the raids. So live long and prosper, everybody. And, and prosper. now comes...